Shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. I saw a really great meme actually just a couple days ago that said something about how we take pictures to come back to moments later. And I think for me, that's always been why I've taken pictures because I probably have about 5,000 on my phone right now because I was just on holidays. And in same thing, it just, it always does come back that I catch, you know, glimpses of one of the photos and it always brings me back to whatever trip I was on or event I was at or, you know, it always brings those memories back, which is fantastic. Nice. Great. Um, so, okay, let me see if I have your, your name. Okay, is it Diane Bator? How would you say your name? Diane Bator. Di there we go. See, all the stress is all wrong. So, Diane Bator. Yes. <laughs> Diane Bator. Uh, where are you in the, at the moment? I am just outside of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Fellow Canadian represent. Okay, okay, okay. So, of course, thank you so much for, for your patience because... Uh, yeah, I guess the time, you know, aligning time zones. Yep. But, well, I really appreciate this. And, uh, yeah, really interested to, to know what, what you sent and who you are and represent for Canada. Um, oh, wait, wait. Are there fires, smoke, haze? What's going on? You know what? Um, it's a huge long story. I just came from Ontario to Alberta. So I just moved here about a month ago. And oh, wow. The day I arrived in Alberta, it would have been June 9th, and my mom is in central Alberta, and she was evacuated the same day I got here. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, so uh, well, I'm trying to move in, and my mom's looking for a place to stay, so thankfully my brother's just down the road, and she stayed with him for the week, and the whole week she was helping us do all our shopping and figuring things out, and it oh, was wow. just... Yeah, and thankfully she went back home after the week, and then they ended up getting so much rain, they had flooding, and it was just oh. awful. But there are parts of Canada that there are still fires going, and, you know, we send them all wow. the best, but we tried to send them the rain. But <laughs> Okay, well, since you said we're trying to send them the rain, let's move on to the first photo, shall we? Absolutely. Nice. Anytime, Anywhere by Diane Bader. Yes? Did I say it right? Wrong. Yeah, I said it wrong. you got it right. You got it right. Did, really? Yeah, okay. you got it right. Anytime, Anywhere. Anytime. Okay, so the photo is, so I have to ask, is this a stock photo or did you make this photo? These would have all been my photos. Uh, amazing. So it's great. So it's it's uh, a photo of a, of, it could be a beach. Or it could be a great lake. I don't know. Uh, there's the sun maybe two hours above the horizon could be morning yeah i'd say maybe it's morning uh and it's um th there's like this shale beach so it's, it's, it's no sand it's not even pebbles it's just these massive plates of wood of uh, not wood of rough stone um the, the light's really warm it's really nice it's a, it's a clear sky you're just at the top 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 left you could just see some hint of brown maybe it's uh, your finger maybe it's hair Hard to know. Probably me. And on, <laughs> and on the stones is a pad of paper, like a coil pad. Uh, nothing's written on the pad, and there's a, a pen, a blue pen, blue ballpoint pen. Pen. Anytime, anywhere. Talk to me. I'm a mystery writer, <laughs> so oh. anytime, anywhere that I get to sit down and write, like literally doctors' offices, you know, just pretty much anywhere. If I'm waiting for people, whatever. That particular picture was taken on the shores of Lake Huron. Um, ah, okay. Probably not, maybe not last summer, the summer before. And it would have been just before sunset because we had a perfect view of the sunset every night. So Nice. Lake Huron. Yeah. Um, what do I know about Lake Huron? Other than it's really big, very little. Uh, were you in a town called Meaford? Um, just outside of Meaford, actually. What? Hey, yeah, you. <laughs> True Canadian. <laughs> there is there is no reason why anyone 
should know where Meaford is, other than people <laughs> from the area. Uh, the reason why I know about it, just like shot in the dark, is I had uh, in in first year university had a friend who was from Meaford, and it's just a, a name that I like to say, Meaford. <laughs> it's so, a great name. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a mystery writer. I am. Yeah, I've written fifteen uh, cozy mysteries now, or published fifteen cozy mysteries. And, yeah, and I started off in Ontario, and like I said, I am. I was born and raised in Alberta, so I'm back in Alberta and looking for some more fun spots to do some writing. Oh, wow. wow. So cozy mysteries, you said? Cozy mysteries, which are, they're kind of, think of um, Murder, She Wrote, um, Monk, Columbo kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. there's been a murder. It's not on screen. You don't see blood, guts, gore. Usually it's some small town person trying to solve the mystery because they have a mm. reason to. But they, I find them kind of fun. Like you can be a little bit more lighthearted in those kind of genres than you can in others. Yeah. Okay. So I had, um, okay, so I come from the world of writing, right? My first degree was in creative writing. So I know that. Um, I had a guest, uh, she was Brazilian. I think she was Brazilian living in Houston. Her first, the English was her second language. Nice. And she wrote romance novels. And when she said it, you know, it was like a, one of those funny conversations where I think you, you bring your your biases, prejudices, or whatever. In my case, I, no, although I know that 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 romances are a massive, um, you know, a section in the bookstore, big sellers, right? But she, from what she described, was that the the boundaries of what 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 fits as a romance are very almost strict. And so, is a cozy mystery as clearly defined? Um, I would say yes. The oh. people have been kind of pushing the boundaries, so you know they they now have what uh, what's the other one now? Brosies. I, I had never okay. heard of that till last year, but it's like guy friends that are solving mysteries which i'm like hey of course <laughs> like generally it's usually a man and a woman or two women so yeah uh -huh. absolutely bring on bring on the guys too because they have a whole different take on all this stuff so <laughs> mm -hmm. so 15 15 books yeah which is your mm, best seller Oh my goodness, I would have to go in and look, but um, actually my current my current new release is the third book in my Glitter Bay Mysteries, and I think that is the one that's been really a good a top seller for me. So Oh nice. And it takes place in a small town. There's um, two sisters who actually own a small vintage clothing shop, and they end mm -hmm. up with a a third sidekick who is a transgender woman mm -hmm. who has become quickly one of my very favorite characters. She's just so much fun to play with. So, right. Okay. Which, well, in a way you kind of answered it, like which um, book was in a way it's it kind of like, it's almost like discovery, right? Like in a way, when you're <laughs> writing, you don't know where the story, <clears throat> you don't know where the story's going. You're just, you're kind of, you're following the characters and in a way they kind of reveal themselves. You have a good night's sleep and you go, oh, hmm, I guess we're going in this direction. Which book probably surprised you the most? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I would say again, probably in my Glitter Base series, having this transgender character come out mm -hmm. and... The character started off, you know, presenting as a male and dressing, kind of cross-dressing, but still talking differently and stuff. And then when her mentor died, which is the big, I'm not giving anything away, it's right on the cover, <laughs> her mentor died. And that's when she came out to these two young ladies and said, look, this, that's not mm. my name. This is my name. I'm a she. Can you please respect that? And that was sort of loosely based on somebody I did I do know and who mm -hmm. always signs her notes to me, Love Quinn. 
<laughs> after the character. So oh, okay. that's a lot of fun. But it's she. This character in particular has taken some fun twists that I wasn't expecting, and there's more to mm-hmm. come. So, so what what is that like? Like in terms of uh, okay, so how did you land in writing? I've always just. When I was a kid, I inhaled books. Like I read everything I could get my hands on. Everything. My mom would go crazy trying to hide her books because some of them weren't meant for kids. So. Yep, we have that same issue with uh, my daughter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, and everything I write, like everything I write right now, my kids have all read. So I mean, oh, they're, okay. now they're in their twenties, but they were reading them back. When they were in their teens, you know, just That's- for mom's request crazy sweet yeah because i remember being that kid and wanting to read everything and and finding a couple of books that i'm like oh maybe this isn't what my mom wanted me to read Hmm. so so going back to your first book where you sat down um do you have training in writing or other than being a writer and writing is just it's an act it's not like some people go to school to learn sure that just fast forwards a lot of the you know, the growth or whatever, but yeah. So what, what was your development as a writer other than always writing? Yeah. Basically for me, it was just always writing and always learning. And I, when I did move originally from Alberta to Ontario, I was lucky enough to get in with a couple of writing groups and I learned a lot from other people about their journey and how they learned how to write and what they knew. And they would edit my work and give me feedback. And a lot of, I mean, I've been, my first book came out about 10 years ago, but I was writing before that and getting feedback all the time on my my grammar, my punctuation. Mm-hmm. The fact that I said, I put in so many exclamation marks. I have a friend who was ready to slap me. <laughs> it was like, I'm going to smack your hand when I see you. Stop That's funny. That. You know, all these years later, I have learned a lot of different things that, you know, if you go to school and do the training and stuff, yeah, you'll learn that right then and there. But when you're doing, you know, when you have another life on the side and you just can't go and do that, you know. You just, you Mm -hmm. learn any way you can. And the more people that you can talk to and work with, the far better your writing will be. Oh, for for sure. But especially writing is ultimately you're, you're doing it for an audience, you know, either, like either you're very consciously writing for a specific reader in a way, or you're, you're externalizing some narrative that you're like, okay, well, at the end of the day, I want somebody to read this. So or you just have to get it out of your head. Yeah. Okay, so, but then to cross that barrier, the threshold, to cross that, that make that first big step of sitting down and, and finalizing a, a manuscript, how long did that take you? My first book, ooh, it took a long time. Um, yep. I, I had a couple of people read it and give feedback, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to try and submit this. And I just... It wasn't going anywhere. I mm. couldn't get people to notice. I would get like, well, send me something else when you get something else. I was like, okay. Yeah. And I ended up, though, getting into an online critique group. And as we would critique each other's pieces of work, there was one person that I thought, you know what? I really like what she does and what she says and how she says it. Because you can have a great editor, but if they kind of smack you every time that you <laughs> they're yeah, giving you yeah. feedback, you're not going to listen to them. She was somebody that I respected and I listened to what she said. And she took my book, she read through it, gave me notes and said, when you're done, send it to this person. And she gave me the name and an email. And I'm like, why would I send oh, it? Oh, nice. So why would I send it to this person? So I Googled her and she was an agent. Nice. So this lady was a reader for an agent, and that's how I got an agent from the story. That's great. It was crazy. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so yeah, it's a great, it's a great shot. Uh, take us back to when you made the photo of the of the pad on the on the on the side of that beach. So do you, are you very? Um, is this a favored beach that you usually go to, or is this just like oh, first time in forever? It was. <laughs> now I'm not out there anymore, so I won't be out yeah. there. 
But um, yeah, um, friend and I would go out there quite often and I would sit and write and my friend would be off fishing or whatever. And it was just great. I could just put my feet up and not worry about anything. Sweet photo. Okay, let's move on to the next. (laughs) I love it. Okay, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's called Books. And uh, so it's a very it's a very cute little sort of book shelf holder thing where the dividers to hold up the books are shaped in the sense in the in, in like wooden pencils. Um, <laughs> it's a weird it's a weird way of, of you know, it's a nice little cute little way of creating this book shelf holder thing. So there's one two three four five six let's say ten books in it. The Jinx of Payrock Canyon. Taddy Lou, uh, I'm just trying to read some of the things. <laughs> the the Bobsy the Bobsy Twins at Meadow Brook. Yes, so it's in somebody's house. Yeah, it's a, look is it behind in the background. Maybe it's somebody's house or a store actually, because there's like it a shisha. It's actually an antique store. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. So there's a shisha there with uh, with the price tag. There's a price tag on 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 the, the desk of these books. Um, okay, why why this photo? I think it's because when we, we just happened to be going through there, that's one of the first places we went through when I moved to this town. And um, I just have always loved books, old books, new mm-hmm. books, old books, paperback. They, they have a smell. And mm-hmm. it's always that you walk into a bookstore and I'm bad. I just stand there and breathe for a couple of minutes. <laughs> and then, mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm, then mm-hmm. I actually go look. But used books are the best. So I love to go into old bookstores and just those ones just happen to come into our path that day. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, like the universe said, okay, here are some books for you to look at. Did you actually buy one of those? I didn't. No, we just kind of were walking through that day and well, I'll go back another day because there's always new stuff and new stuff sure. in an antique store. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, you have kids. How many kids do you have? I have three kids, yeah. Three kids. Well, respect. Three kids. I mean <laughs> three boys no less, so yeah. <laughs> ah. Yeah, respect. <laughs> Triple respect. Uh any of them um have the same kind of itch, passion, sort of focus around books, reading, writing? Um my oldest is an out he loves to read. But, um, and, and when they were younger, they would do some writing and stuff. They're actually, there's a couple of them with a lot of talent, but mm-hmm. uh, at this point in their lives, they've just kind of shelved it and, you know, they might come back later on and once they get older or something and say, you know, I still have this story in my head from when I was 10. So I'm yeah. going to do something with it. So we'll wait and see. Mm. You're a Canadian, a Canadian mm-hmm. author. What what can we okay? So one of the things about okay, so I was thinking about this because a friend of mine went to Australia, and her being in Australia kind of reminded me of just these massive landscapes where everything's separated by huge distances, and big open spaces of, of fauna and and well solitude and and all these things. And uh, I just came back from, so I'm now I'm in Hong Kong. I was in Canada la- this time last year, roughly. And uh, I spent a, almost a year away from my daughter and, and my wife here in Hong Kong. So, so how can you communicate, like how would you put into words that, that thing about being Canadian that makes being a writer different? That's kind of tough too. It's interesting you were saying all that because, as I said, I just moved from, I was born and raised in Alberta, moved to Ontario. Literally a month ago, I had my all of my earthly belongings and my two cats, and we drove from Toronto area to Calgary. And, oh, wow. yeah, <laughs> you know, solitude, oh, yeah, like, so for, for somebody who doesn't know Canada, what is that distance roughly? Oh, well, we were, it was about 36 hours of driving. So just under about 3,500 kilometers for yeah, right. those who speak kilometer. 
Um, yeah, so yeah, let's, let's say three three thousand miles. Yeah. So basically, for me, it was about five, um, four eight hour days and one five hour day of driving. Right. Wow. That's not little breaks. That's just in the car and driving. Just driving, yeah. With yep. a cat beside me howling at the top of his lungs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I don't recommend it. <laughs> uh, look, you know, um, a few years ago, flew back from Hong Kong to Victoria. No, no, actually to Vancouver. And I brought with me two dogs and two cats. It was just me. <laughs> and then brought the two dogs and two cats to Victoria where I was staying. And it was just me. And uh, yeah, yeah, several panic attacks later, back in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, panic attacks kind of sums it up, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Sure. Okay, so who you are, for whatever reason, leads you to being a writer to tell stories, and in your case, mystery. Cozy mystery. Uh, cozy is a funny word to use. Okay. It's like, uh, it's like meat and potatoes. It's like sit on the sofa, get a good blanket, and just read a nice, sweet mystery. Exactly. So sell, okay, so sell your most recent book. Like, what is it called? Tell me more about it. Absolutely. Um, my latest book is called All That Shimmers. It's the third book in my Glitter Bay Mysteries. And the short form of it is the main character's ex-husband. She finds him dead in her front, in her back courtyard. Mm. And she kind of has this urge to figure out who did it before the local police decides she's done it. And even though uh, she had no idea he was even in her house or on her property. Mm. So there's a little bit of um, her kind of going back and soul searching her relationship with him and everything. And then a lot of her past comes back to haunt her in that book. But uh, as always, there's some there's some fun moments. There's some bad moments. So, <laughs> and um, you know, it's just it's a fun mystery, and I, I had a lot of fun writing this one. So nice. If you can hear a dog yelping, <laughs> it's because uh, we have lots of dogs, lots of cats. So the age, the, like when you're writing, do you have an age bracket in your head? Like in terms of, like, is it, or is the, or at this point, is the form, is it basically a tone? Is it basically a kind of, because in a way, it's like you've built this, this mastery where your brain kind of just goes immediately, okay, this is, these are, so it's going to be a little bit more efficient as far as writing the, the narrative. But uh, how clear are you in terms of, of the ultimate reader in your, in your mind? One of my things is I always write books that I would love to read. Right. So, you know, some somebody like I have friends in their 20s and on up to I have a, a lovely lady in her 70s who just loves reading them. So nice. My readers are kind of all over the age brackets and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and any genre or any uh, gender as well, because I have like couple of transgender friends who just adore them and and a few male friends who are like okay when's the next one coming come on uh that's sweet yeah sure i mean absolutely i think i think if that's what you're it's a funny thing to write and to kind of construct a story and in this case it's going to be fiction with threads from your life and then to have somebody kind of resonate with it and go like wow yeah that that really kind of evoked something and it could just be entertainment. It could just be pleasure. It could just be like, this is how I how wind down. Yeah. So how many books in the can do you have at a time? You know what? Having just moved, I will have to sit down and <laughs> relook at all that. Um, <laughs> I have, let me see. I have four series that have been on the go. One I just wrapped up last, last year. And then the other three, I think one of them will be wrapping up. I'm just not sure if there's one or two more books left in that series. That's mm -hmm. kind of my, I have to figure it out before next June. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Deadline. <laughs> and oh, then, really? Yeah. Yeah. And then I have another one that's coming out next September. And that's a Canadian historical mystery that's set in Ontario. So, ah. Uh. So for the person who's not in that world, is there like 
the the seedy underbelly of the the book writing world where where, where you, the contracts you have are just so difficult and the, the people you work with are so demanding and there's like this torment and gossip and yeah. it's like i must read a book ah um or is it a little bit less uh, dramatic you know what i've i've been at both ends of things like I've, what i have had a publisher who was a little on the dramatic side and ended up giving back <laughs> all my rights and going i'm not doing this because she didn't like a, you know, yeah okay it was one of those and i just went okay that's fine and i time to move on well, the funniest part was this was at t 10 to 4 on a Tuesday, and I got the message saying that they were going to release my books. They were not going to publish them anymore. And I was like, oh, man. Oh. And I'm having a moment, and I'm like, oh, 10 minutes of what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then I left work, and I walked home. And by the time I got home 15 minutes later, I had a plan. <laughs> nice. And I reached out to... Um, a Canadian publisher who has been publishing my books for 10 years now. We've been, nice. I've been working with them for 10 years. And um, they were like, oh, yeah, send us your books. So Wicked. less than 24 hours later, I had a plan. We already had a plan to redo them all. And they came out the That's following great. a few months later. Okay. So talk, talk about uh, that idea of or the struggle or the, the process of, cause, cause you know, writing a book is such a solitary um, experience and then you want to get it published. So that means of knocking on doors and, and dealing with rejection. I mean, maybe you haven't had to deal with a lot of rejection. Um, what, how, what's your relationship to no? I, I remember I said before, I was really lucky. I managed to get an agent early on and she helped me develop the first book, helped me. We went through the door knocking and she mm -hmm. was kind of at the point. It's like, well, maybe we should just give up. But she goes, I have a few more ideas. One of the ideas she had was with the publisher I'm with now and okay. been with them for 10 years now. And I'm actually starting work for them now that I've moved here. Uh, I will be starting work for them in the next month. So it's oh. very, very full circle kind of thing. So I'll be starting to look at new writers and stuff as well. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. So, but it was very kind of cool. Like, I mean, we lost that other publisher. Um, my Canadian publisher was great. They took the books that I had a publisher in California and she just kind of went through and, she did a hack job with a bunch of authors she had with her and a few of us were kind of going, yeah, I don't know what's happening, but okay. So yeah, I brought my books here and they've been doing really well and I've just had nothing but good since then. Um, I did part ways with my agent, mostly because mm -hmm. Canadian author working with a US agent and a Canadian publisher Mm. caused her a lot more headaches than she expected. <laughs> sure. I believe I believe it. I believe it. Okay, well, let's... Okay, before we move on to the next photo, you have a website, I imagine? Yeah, it's super easy, dianebater.ca. Okay, wicked, dianebater.ca. Oh, look at that. Okay, so first of all, we'll talk about the background. Sunny, sunny day, cumulus clouds. There could very well be a, a polarizing filter because the clouds are popping. The, the sky is dark blue, really beautiful. Far off, you see this nice high mountain. Uh, no snow on the peak, but uh, it starts breaking above the, the tree line. It's very nice. And then there's the, the perspective is of a road, straight road going straight through. It looks like a small village. And in the front is you doing a selfie, holding up the camera. Uh, your glasses are on the top of your head. Your hair is pulled back. Uh, the sun is making you. I mean, it looks like a nice summer scene. And it's called Canmore, Alberta. Di sorry, Diane in Cal Canmore, Alberta. <laughs> yep. Let's talk Canmore. Yeah. So what's this? We, I live not far away from Canmore now, so Canmore and Banff, we've been out there a couple of times since I moved out here, 
And yeah, no filters, no nothing on that. That's just cell phone. So amazing. Yeah. And that's been one of the great things about moving back to this part of the country is the Rocky Mountains are absolutely incredible and totally inspiring. And even <laughs> I went this past week, I was actually out in the Okanagan and taking a zillion pictures because, you know, you just can't help it up there for sure. And coming back through the mountains, the same thing, like just mm -hmm. it's awe inspiring and the book and my camera. So, Right, right. So, so what's for somebody who's uh, listening in from the Philippines or Australia? What's a what's a Banff and what's an Okanagan? Um, Banff. Funny is, words. Yeah, Banff is a funny word, absolutely. But it is a little resort town in the Rocky Mountains, about forty five minutes ish from Calgary, which mm -hmm. is a very major city. Um, Okanagan, the Okanagan Valley, is kind of the valley between two uh, mountain ranges and they get very hot very dry and they grow amazing grapes and cherries and peaches we've been eating cherries all week mm, nice and they have as my brother says there's 400 vineyards within like a stone's throw of his house basically yep there's yep. the most incredible wines and they have actually inspired a whole other mystery series that I will be working on over the winter. Right. Well, I was going to ask how the landscape was going to affect your writing, because it's one thing to be on, on the Canadian Shield out in Ontario, where it's kind of flat and kind of rolling hills and old, old landscape versus moving over. And the Rocky Mountains are so dramatic. It's like, it's funny when people picture Canada and they've never been, what they picture is British Columbia, you know, with the big, big mountains and the, the big ocean and the big trees and everything's big. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how familiar is the Okanagan within you and, and, and also Banff, like that whole area, because this goes back to your childhood, I imagine. Um, not so, not really so much. Um, I mean, I had been out to the Okanagan as a kid, but it wasn't until about five years ago. Um, ah. My brother lives in the Calgary area, and they have bought a cottage out in the Okanagan. So I've been out there now two or three times now. Oh, but well. we take all these little dirt roads up to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> there's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's so many things you see and all of the wildlife, like we were chasing turtles off the road and luring snakes <laughs> off the road. And there was deer and uh, quail, which if you've never heard of quail, you do have to Google that sound because they are just hysterically funny. Mm. It was so cute. Um, nice. Yeah, it's just the wildlife is and that's even driving from Ontario. It took me two and a half days to get out of Ontario. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I was leaving close to Toronto, two and a half days to get around the north side of Lake Superior. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. massive. And the same thing, there was the moose and the deer and the bears and all of those animals that you read about, they, they're, they're standing right there looking at you. It's just <laughs> absolutely phenomenal so i love the, i love this idea that um somebody listening who's from another complete so for example i'm in hong kong right now right uh I, my wife told me that there's something like 2000 species of butterfly and moth in in hong kong now hong kong is territory wide probably the size of uh toronto's the Toronto, this is GTA, like the, the main sort of full area of Toronto, right? So within that are seven and a half million people and two more than 2,000 species of butterfly and moth. I think Canada has 300 species of butterflies. Like it's something, it's just, the, the biodiversity out here is bonkers. <laughs> but I often feel that people here almost don't see it. You know, like it's, because it, it's absolutely everywhere where you'll have Burmese pythons, you have wild boar and all these things, m monkeys sometimes. But um, but when you go to Canada, it's like everything's big. So it's just like, oh, moose, yes, um, <laughs> bear, of course. 
So how do you think that shapes, like what is it that's unique about the Canadian experience? Now, I know it's, a, it's, a, it's a, maybe it's a crazy question. I had no idea I was going to ask it, but here we are. Oh, no. You know, one of the things that made me laugh years ago, um, my mom's family came over from Holland, for example, and we had relatives that came over and they decided that well, they're staying in, in Edson. They were going to walk over to Edmonton and then walk down to Calgary and then come back through Banff and Jasper. Well, just from my grandma's house to Edmonton is two hours driving. Yeah. From Edmonton to Calgary is about three hours yeah. driving. So it's just like you said, it's that bigness. It's that sure. the concept that you can't just walk to the next town and and see what you want yep. to see. You you have to take a car everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I when I met my wife, she was living in Montreal and I was living in Toronto. And I tell the story, people were just like, oh, okay, wow. And I said, yeah, yeah. So we, we have to do like a funny commute. Sometimes I'd hitchhike, you know, I'd hitchhike to, to, to Montreal from Toronto. <laughs> and uh, people were just like, oh, how far is that? I was like, oh, it's 700 kilometers. And that's that's not even that's not even that's not far. Like as far as Canada is concerned, seven hundred kilometers is like yeah yeah. That's just yeah. They just do that over the weekend. <laughs> yeah. So so what what uh, sparked the move back to to yeah to, to Alberta? Well, there were a lot of things. Like um, my job was good, but I wasn't. You know, it was kind of a dead end thing at that point. Mm -hmm. And the relationship I was in wasn't going anywhere. And one of my kids was already moving back. I think he moved back a month before me. And oh, wow. then one of my other kids said, well, you know what? I'm going to do that too. But he's kind of on hold right now for a job. But it was just my family's here. I had I lived in Ontario for about 18 years. And I just, it was time to come back home. Yeah. That makes, makes really good sense. Uh so as you're speaking, you're saying this, I've got the photo of you. I mean, the photo was made recently, I guess. Is this summer? Uh, yeah. The view with, in Canmore? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so it's basically Canada at its best. Super bright, super hot. Everything grows. Everything's great. How does the winter sit in your head as a writer? The thing I love about winter is I can curl up with a blanket on the couch and a hot chocolate or a cup of tea and I can read, I can write and I don't feel guilty because I don't have to be outside doing something else. <laughs> right. Unless I have right. to dig out the car. <laughs> sure. Okay. So, so uh, in terms of like the breadth and the scope, like in terms of uh, how you, you construct your narratives, like, is it all contained within Canada? Like how big is the world that you create? Um, when I first started, because I started with a U.S. agent and a U.S. publisher at one point, some of my stories were kind of set in a smaller U.S. town, but I don't do the whole, how do you want to say it? I'm not like USA, USA. It's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's big enough that it could be either side of the border. Right. But I mean, they, they live in their own little bubbles pretty much, except for the one town, because there's a little back and forth between characters coming from L.A. or Seattle and stuff like that. It's it's a smaller bubble. They're not international sure. or anything. Um, that may change with a couple of books that I have in the back of my head. There's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots, of, lots of things coming. So. so in writing a cozy mystery... How much, how much sex is there? Is this something that you kind of go into, or is it one of these things that is more like, is it still kind of separated as a kind of like, well, yeah. it's it's a hinted, it's a it's a, you know what I mean? Like how how adult do we get here? The most cozies are pretty much just hinted at. It's same oh, with okay. the murder. The murder doesn't actually occur on the page. You don't see blood gut score, but you hear oh, so-and-so died, and this is what they died of, and that's kind of the end of that. Um, mm. The same with the sex. Like, there's a little bit of romance for sure, but anything beyond that is behind a closed door. Ah, okay. 
Foreplay of murder, foreplay of... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, like, uh, uh, we can continue on this. Particular. So the, the title of the book, again, is... All That Shimmers. All That Shimmers. And the, the series is called... The Glitter Bay Mysteries. The Glitter Bay Mysteries. Love it. Okay, so let's move on to the next photo. Aha, the murder weapon. I see it. It's called Life's Too Short, Dessert First. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be my murder weapon for sure. <laughs> yeah, the author the author killed killed the, the butler with a cone of coffee. Okay, so uh, not a cone, a cone of ice cream. Uh, so it's a close-up shot of uh, maybe your left hand holding up a waffle cone. There's a little bit. You can just see the hint of the of the of the napkin at the bottom. It's freshly scooped. It's a funny thing that when when you know how photography works, how product photography works, like when you do product photography of of, uh, of ice cream, it's usually not ice cream because that would just melt. So it's usually stuff like mashed potato or whatever. So in this particular case, if you just look at the stuff. And, and you're, you're sort of separated from the high sugar content. And okay, so it's this really strange brown color, almost tan. It's a very full cone, caramel something, coffee something. Um, dessert first. Why, why dessert first? Life's too short. Absolutely. My uh, late mother-in-law was notorious for every time she'd look after the kids, they would have chocolate cake before they had dinner ah uh, nice and, nice uh, she always thought we never knew but then one day we <laughs> went to the freezer and went oh there's already a cake in here and, oh <laughs> so we loved one <laughs> that's really funny but yeah it, it was always she was always telling the kids you know life's too short you have to eat your dessert first and hopefully they ate dinner sometimes i'm not so sure but you know that's really sweet but in the end they turned out okay Oh, yeah. They grew? Yeah. They grew? They're fine? Well. They're fine. <laughs> so where did you make this photo? That was actually after Canmore, and we stopped at an ice cream shop, and it was just because it looked so good. <laughs> it was, right. You know, just one of those things, and it was, I can't even remember what the flavor was now, but it was like an espresso with um, little bits of chocolate and little bits of caramel in it. It was so good. Yep, it looks it looks it looks nice. It looks very nice. Uh, so one of the um, when I was in in BC, I got myself a motorcycle and then I did a tour of basically Vancouver Island. Uh, just did about like five or six hundred kilometers one afternoon. And um, one place that I stopped at was super super hot, and uh, I wanted ice cream, so I stopped over and got this ice cream. And it's just massive massive ice cream, and then. Uh, some kid is like, he got also got some like triple scoop or whatever. And he's standing there and we're both outside. It was like, we had this moment where he, this kid's probably about like 11 years old. Uh, I'd say uh, relatively dorky looking. He was kind of dorky looking with this big sort of ice cream. And he was just like eyes wide. And we're both sitting there. It was really funny. Like me, like me and my little motorcycle outfit looking at an ice cream and he, him next to me. And then, and there was this thing where I kind of was look was looking at him, and he he was he took a very exuberant lick, like in a sense it's like here's this moment, you know life's too short, and he's just like surrendered to the whole sensual sort of state of just like licking this ice cream, and then of course it popped off the cone and fell oh, on the no. ground. So it was like a <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and i was like there's a life lesson in that my young friend <laughs> but i let he was he was devastated he was devastated Aww. okay <laughs> so so i just told you a very silly story now why don't you weave some kind of insight from your life as to this idea of life's too short because that's really the, the point of the podcast right so life's too short dessert first no, it was really funny when I, I sat down and I was reading what the podcast was about. And I'm like, you know, it's kind of ironic because this is probably a raw point in my life right now. Just this whole move across the country and basically starting over. Like I had whatever fit in my car, which 
ironically, I had to get a bigger car before I left because my car wasn't going to make mm-hmm. it. But um, it was just me and my two cats and everything we own was in that car. And um, coming out here, I'm, as I said, I'm just waiting to start my new job with my publisher, which I'm super excited about. But I think this is the longest point in many years that I've just been kind of still. Not, mm-hmm. I don't have to get up and go to work. I don't have to get up and, you know, take care of kids. I don't have to get up and do this. And it's just a couple of mornings it was like, okay, so what do I do? <laughs> mm. so, yeah. so it's like, okay, where's my pen and paper? I need to get some writing in or I need to do some editing. And, you know, it's. It's just that whole starting over from raw. Yeah. Nice. And in a way, facing possibility and just kind of having that. It's funny because when you're when you're parenting, like actively parenting, full on parenting, in a sense, your your needs are focused. Like you say, like, okay, this is what you have to do to get through your day. This is what's going to happen. Uh, and then once your kids kind of give you that space, move out or, or, or you move out. And as you're here, you're, it's like, oh, I have to decorate a new living space and then create a new, 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 new relationship to my environment. Right. Yep. How's it going? How are you doing? Very slowly. <laughs> like I said, the first week I was here, we ended up with my mom here. So we ended up out and about and doing the shopping stuff more than actually unpacking. The second mm-hmm. week, I think I just sat there going, wow. <laughs> and the third week yeah. I went to the Okanagan and I took a real vacation. Just, just me. Nice. I didn't have to worry nice. about kids or anything. It was just, you know, my brother and my sister-in-law and I, and we just did what we felt like doing every day, which was That's really great. awesome. And now I'm, back in the apartment going, oh, I have to get my computer set up because I'm doing this podcast. And I don't know where my webcam is. <laughs> so good. It's, it's, listen, it's, and I'm sorry I was late, but it's all good. It worked out in the end. <laughs> yeah, so, so just so you can, um, I've decided to maybe weave this as a kind of, because um, like the podcast evolves in the way that your writing evolves, right? Yes. So, so, 150 plus episodes down i'm like okay what else can i can i add to to enrich both your experience in this conversation and maybe the listener's experience so i was thinking maybe weaving in some of the things that that i've developed and learned over the past you know 20 years that i've lived in hong kong so how's this let's turn let's turn the focus we'll just turn it around we'll spin the camera backwards and then I think you've had enough seeds in this in your soil, in your fertile soil, fertile mind. Why don't you ask me a question? What would you like to know? Okay, how did you get started doing a podcast? Ah, there we go. Okay, so oh. the podcast. Uh, so I'm that kind of person who, if you're a writer, you definitely have this, right? Where it takes a kind of disquiet or a kind of uh, a restlessness and... Um, Sometimes in your case, I guess that restlessness it turns into a narrative where you wake up one morning and you're just like, that's kind of what I'm going to write in that direction. Maybe. I'm, not, I'm just projecting, but maybe that's a bit like you. In my case, every once in a while, I'll have this impulse. And so when the pandemic started, I took my daughter uh, from Hong Kong to Savannah, Georgia, right where my sister lives. So wh- this was in the early weeks when... COVID just hit Hong Kong and Hong Kong was like this sort of ground zero epicenter. It was like, ah, so uh, we thought, okay, look, I'll just take her away. So she, cause they're doing remote schooling anyways. So take her away to, to, to Savannah, stay there for however long and then come back after COVID is done. Right. Sure. <laughs> so we're there seven weeks. I decided, okay, well I'll start a project, which was to create a podcast based loosely around people's photographs and telling stories. And and the idea that we only have one life. How do we make it count? Absolutely. Have you ever written a book? Uh, there are six books out there in uh, nonfiction books. 
I was a ghostwriter for a very kind of a successful Hong Kong businessman. And so one of the, like two of the books are kind of co-authored. The other books were ghostwritten. And the, the whole function of those things are, are around this thing called service leadership and what I call service network leadership. So I was thinking about you as, as this sort of, so will you be working remotely or for this job or are you going to be going into the office? I will be working remotely. Um, I do kind of hop over to her office every now and then because she needs to show me a lot of stuff because eventually I will be taking over as publisher and she'll be taking on more of a marketing role. So it's like, oh, wow. It's, That's great. It's a big scary right now. Wrapping my head around the fact that I will be my own publisher is just kind of mind blowing. But, um, yeah, no, I'm sure you're gonna. So what what happens? I think what happens is that we we go through experiences and we 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 learn so much on the way that that consciously maybe you if I said okay write down what you've learned and you'll be like write down what I've learned it's like yeah yeah like write down what you've learned about being a publisher here's a page or here's a notebook and then just give me a list and then you'll sit there and you can start dra drafting a list and maybe after fifteen or twenty things. You'll be like, okay, listen, this is getting tiring. This is so boring. This is like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but what you're, that's only what you're conscious of. Yeah. There's this whole, like, there's more than a decade of, of training on what it's like to be on the writer's side working with a publisher that is just so full and so rich that uh, I have no question and full confidence that you're going to be just fine. <laughs> well, the funniest part was, is the first day we sat down and we were doing training. She's showing me all these things. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I do that. I've done that. Sure. I've done that. Because I've also worked with other authors and um, I do book coaching and stuff as well. So I help them develop their book from, you know, kind of chicken scratch. What In one author's case, yes, chicken scratch on a page to we're getting ready probably publish his book next year so it's i've already kind of taken that journey on my own and built that little mm -hmm. foundation so i already have the clue what i'm doing yep. it's just going to be getting in there and getting to work doing it and and like it's like driving when you first start you're just like what do i have to pay attention to ah and then you know after a few weeks you'll be like yeah yeah i know what i'm doing you tell everybody else what they're doing wrong. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, okay, so somebody who's listening, who who's thinking, uh, writing a book, writing a book, is there a book in me? How, how do you help them cross that? How do you help them kind of find that inner sort of momentum to start writing? Absolutely. I've worked with a couple of people that they're like, yeah, I have this book, I have this idea. And you just have to sit and write out the ideas, like write out, even if you just make point notes, start mm -hmm. out somewhere. Um, eventually you'll figure out if you're really good at putting it together as a book or not. It's like I've worked with people who have managed to make these little notes and make it turn into more of a story than they thought they would be able to. And mm -hmm my friend that I'm writing a fantasy novel with, I just go along and flesh it out behind him because he's doing a pretty good job of it now. Right. right. Um, and whereas I've had other people that have sent me stuff that I'm like, this is an outline. You mm -hmm. have to fill in the blanks and I can't do that part for you. This is your book. You need to fill this out the way you want it. You just, if you want to write a book, the strongest piece of advice is write what you love to read and learn your craft. Because if you don't learn how to write and you just throw a book out there, it's not going to go anywhere. People won't read it. Mm -hmm. Right. Excellent advice. Thank you. Excellent advice. And also, you know, life's too short. Jump into that ice cream. Um, <laughs> uh, th these conversations are great. Thank you so much. Uh, one more time, your website. DianeBater.ca. Sweet. Diane, thank you so much. Have a fantastic uh, week. And uh, yeah. You as well, Ren. Thank you so much. Shooting it raw?